seems to work, right? Okay. Welcome everyone to this um, actually lab session today. So um, instead of a lecture, I'll be giving um, yeah, the next lab session now and in the original lab slot, we'll also continue doing something with um, APIs and evaluation and afterwards there'll be probably plenty of time for some Q&A for the projects. And um, yeah, next week there will be holidays, so no lecture, no lab. But uh, the week after, uh, we will have your presentations in the lab slot probably. And hopefully, um, if um, health permits, uh, Benno will be giving um, the maybe final um, yeah, lecture presentation about uh, attention and transformers. So I will start with a quick recap about what we did last time, because um, that topic was fundamentally unrelated, at least at first, to what we are originally doing here. So I'll maybe go over the most important aspects again. Uh, we talked about the motivation, what front engineering is. Um, we, we noticed that this is quite different from the approach that you would normally take, um, training a neural network or doing at least a retraining on the head. No, we don't do that here. We take everything pre-trained, basically. Um, that was one aspect. And on the other hand, we then noticed that the behavior of the model is almost completely controlled by the model input, which we called the prompt. This is why we're calling this prompt engineering. We try to modify this prompt to get our desired outputs. And we already noticed with plenty of examples that there are some problems with this, that this doesn't quite always work. Um, we will go further into details today about what these problems are caused by, how we may prevent them in the end. But keep that in mind that some new problems arise here that we don't know from classic deep learning yet. We talked about the relevance to the term projects. So maybe you already, at least I saw that in, the, in some group channels, uh, tried a bit around with um, the open AI GPT-3 playground and try to apply this to some problem statements that you know from your term projects. And um, yeah, my invitation to you is to also use the next uh, one and a half week that you have got to also explore a bit more into that direction. Uh, we talked about the prompt engineering project, so keep that in mind in two weeks. There are those details. Then all of you, I think, um, started playing around with the GPT-3 playground and were quite amazed uh, um, if, if I read it correctly or saw it correctly here um, about the results and the seemingly um, simplic or seeming simplicity of extracting results there. Then I walked over some examples and also gave you a hint to where you can find more uh, examples that you could also uh, explore a bit for your project engineering mini projects. Maybe um, I'd like to recap some of those examples again, what we did here. So we did, um, oh, wait a second, we did this Q&A prompt. Uh, maybe this didn't get quite clear, but we'll come across this again today. These Q&A um, prompt particles are used to actually force generation of an answer here. But this is all implicitly done through the prompt. So in the early days of maybe GPT-2, we'll also be using that in, in the next slot. Um, a simple prompt of a question would lead to other related questions being generated. I mean, this is not unprobable in the training data, at least, uh, which is web data that um, 
on one question doesn't follow the answer, but rather another question, a related question, for example. And you, you will see that probably also today. So this is the reason why people in the early days of front engineering already introduced this Q and A uh, um, yeah, prompt structure. We talked about that. Then we st talked about stop sequences. This is also important uh, to follow along today. So if, if there are any problems or questions about the stop sequence, please just ask. Um, yeah, we talked about magic spells in general, but this was maybe the first approach for you to see that, or what generative um, means in contrast to, to just um, yeah, classification task. Summarization, also quite interesting, explored a bit around with this. Uh, probably won't do similar tasks today, but um, keep that in mind also for your projects. Might be interesting. We had this structured extraction of analogies. And um, yeah, keep that in mind. We uh, took a few samples or shots actually and gave them to the model, but I will formalize a bit uh, later what I mean by this. This will also be helpful. And finally, we are talking about the group name generation for your um, yeah, term project groups. And some groups actually did that, which was quite funny. And one thing I also learned while checking out your results or your prompts that you delivered there is that there are some misconceptions about um, yeah, how prompting actually work and how this continuing prompting works. So if you take the playground and um, post an example, I need a group name. The name is let's generate something the limitless group, and now you continue generating. Give me more names. And actually, this originally output of the model is now treated as an input and will influence the behavior of the future model's uh, um, output. So you can see here, because we have this group statement, this explicit group term here, all our results actually um, contain this. Let's take something else here. So imagine the model would have given us that. Yeah, then, then we get a different pattern of generation. So keep that in mind. Uh, but thanks to those of you who actually submitted this prompt so I can see what's going on there. Um, this is not only dangerous. So it could, it could be dangerous, right? If you generate something, introduce some bias, are not satisfied with the results and now try to get back from bad results that you don't like into results or a result space that you like, um, this doesn't work because everything that the model once set, if you keep it in the prompt form, um, will be included into the prompt for the next input. So keep that in mind that the input for the uh, LLM should be as polished and as clean as possible. We also have some examples on this. Um, but it's, it's not only dangerous to allow this, to allow the model to actually feed code, if you want, back into itself. So um, if you think about that, this sounds a bit like uh, a Turing machine, actually, where um, code is stored um, on the same location as uh, the execution. Uh, or, or at the data in general, but yeah, the, the program can write itself basically. So this is what will happen also a bit later today. We'll explore, explore this possibility a bit more into detail. Are there questions about this quick recap of last week?
Okay, I think I forgot something to say. Ah, I wanted to announce that videos are online. So uh, last week I promised you to record two more videos, one about Big Bench and one about the Web Archive Processing Pipeline. And I did both. They are both online, but not visible through the YouTube channel. So you will have to go to the lecture website. But uh, they are online, feel free, or I would like to encourage you to check them out. Uh, the pipeline video is relevant for uh, those term project teams that chose um, pipeline-related or web data-related projects. And um, yeah, so feel free to use that. And the other video is actually a bit more for those of you who want to go further into detail with um, yeah, with prompt engineering, but also with evaluations. Uh, it will come back to us in the next slot, but um, where we'll be using some API functionality from uh, the library that I introduced to you in that video. But no worries, uh, you can also watch it afterwards. I will make it all uh, compatible. But the idea was to introduce you to an effort or project to make prompt engineering um, measurable or to, to measure using metrics um, the success of different prompt engineering tasks or, or uh, ideas. Well, not quite correctly that because people are not trying in that project to actually optimize the prompts, but rather take raw unoptimized prompts, feed them into the model, and if a human should be able to or would be able to solve um, those tasks, then a machine should also. And prompt engineering should ideally not take a big role in that, because yeah, that means that the machines are not perfect yet. So um, this big bench project is aiming to um, go around that and just evaluate without much prompt engineering, but. The efforts or the aspects or the attempts that they make in order to quantify the performance are actually quite useful also for prompt engineering, um, which is why we, are, we will be also talking about this in, um, in the next slot. Okay, I hope we have no more questions in the chat maybe. Uh, it should be, yeah, let's, let's check it out. Thank you. The question was, where is it? It should be those two. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe I should say this more explicitly. Also for the other videos, there are some, when I announced to record a video, then it's hidden somewhere over here. So I did that once already with, um, Weights and biases, I think, was a post-uploaded video. And also one other video, I think. Uh, so, so feel free to check them out. There should be no really big surprises because we talked about everything, basically, what, um, what I was going to record. But um, yeah, maybe the naming could be overhauled. OK. Thanks for the question. Um, I think I'll continue. So in this session, I want to talk about strategies for prompt engineering that might help you to actually step a bit away from this trying out behavior um, into, yeah, thoughtful or intended um, prompt writing where you have a bit of a confidence that your prompts are going to work, or at least an idea if they don't work, why? So this one week we had now uh, um, after the last session was intended for you to, be, to get a bit um, into trying out those prompts and now we can talk about uh, what to do and what to improve. So one thing I noticed um, with many, many people that start prompt engineering and also with some of you that 
shared your results, is that uh, people tend to command the machine. So to write imperatives like, um, give me a text that, and so on. Originally, this wasn't working at all. So originally, um, people couldn't, couldn't write that in a prompt form. It would just generate maybe more imperatives. Uh, just the same with questions. If you write one question, the idea of uh, LLMs was to give you more questions. Um, we'll probably see that a bit uh, later when we step back to GPT-2 and try it out a bit because we can do that without um, get the API and can do that locally or in a collab. But um, try to understand that this is not the intended way. Also, do not think that the machine is talking to you. So I noticed people writing dialogues with um, yeah, with the prompt form, basically, and uh, the, the using it as a chat box, because, I mean, it looks like a chat box, right? You have this text uh, slowly showing up and being typed as if, and if you ask a question, then something that could resemble an answer comes up. So it's, it's not that unnatural to start talking to the machine, but this is not the way it is intended. And actually you're not talking to a conscious, uh, conscious AI, you are still filling out or doing prompt completion. So this is the way you should think about this. Think about this as give me an output which resembles the most probable completion. So in the end, yes, the most probable completion for a question might be an answer. But think about the space where this was trained on and the space where this or the data which, was, which this was trained on is internet data. And on the internet, um, it's not that uncommon to have FAQs, for example, or um, forums where you can ask questions and get answers. But in the beginning of, of uh, large language models, this was all very raw. And if you did an imperative, you wouldn't get a response because on, uh, on one website, for example, would you imagine that someone could write an imperative and the next statement on that website would be the immediate response doing exactly what it was told in the imperative. This is not good um, because sometimes we want to formulate imperatives and I'll talk a bit later um, about how or um, yeah, with what measures people came around this. So in modern LLMs, you can actually use imperatives, but try to not think about um, this, this pattern or this behavior and try to rather formulate tasks as a completion. So to give you a quick example, let's maybe do that um, quickly here. So the imperative form would be translate how are you to German? And actually with GPT-3, you would get an answer. Great. But now let's formulate this in a declarative way. Uh, does anyone here have an idea maybe how we, yeah. The German translation of how are you. Thank you. The German translation. Is. And now I can uh, use colon or not, um, doesn't really matter, but yes, thank you. This is the way this is intended, actually. You can also phrase this as a question. What is the German translation of how are you? And it would work as well, but you can try it out at home with GPT-2. I will give you uh, all the code that you will need and you will see that it will be much harder for um, hard questions to actually get a sense, uh, 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 get a response that makes sense. Um, yeah, and this uh, machine is talking to your approach. Maybe we demonstrate that again. Hi, could you tell me what the translation of are you in German is 
So this is the way maybe, I don't know, uh, stu school students would um, slide into prompt engineering. And you can see it works. But there's a very specific reason that it works. It's because the model was redone and retrained with this kind of engineering pattern in mind. So the original uh, GPT model would not be able to do such things. And this, uh, this was one of the great innovations of um, the new or the newer models uh, to include this. I, I will also give you the name of a paper that uh, introduced this by, I think by altering the training data set a bit or the training regime regime. And I will give you the name and also an example where this happens and where this fails. Let me quickly check the chat. Uh, uh, okay, I, I lost the context here. What about the that you already presented this loop name generation? So you you shouldn't use whatever generated it. Ah, thank you. Yeah, then I'll read the question again. So Finn asked, I, are such best practices like your hint to change the prompt for group name results deposited, uh, ah, formalized, published somewhere? Um, I, I mean this, um, yes, yes. And there's a name for this. And this name is one shot learning or few shot learning, but I'll come to that later. So it's documented, yes. But um, something like wikis. What do you mean with wikis? Maybe some, some knowledge base that people created to collect knowledge about this? Ah, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, Twitter. Twitter is your friend there because everyone basically who does a prompt engineering today and uh, creates some new prompts that generate insights and doesn't intend on publishing it uh, later, basically just drops a quick tweet so this, this really helps if you also want to stay in the loop. But uh, also on Reddit, I found some good examples and of course blog posts, um, not so much medium.com actually at the moment. But um, yeah, I don't know of any particular wiki, for example, where you could found, uh, find such strategies. So oh, there was another message. Um, Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question, yeah. Okay, now we explored some ways of do's and don'ts in formulating prompt engineering um, questions or prompts. Um, you'll see later that the models quite explicitly, if you're not inside such a playground, um, state this task as completion. So um, it's explicitly labeled as completion and you should also think about this as a completion. Um, yeah, beware of internet language. We will discover some ways in a minute to actually prevent the leakage of bad internet language into your outputs. Because if you imagine you do a startup where you do customer support, for example, automatically by uh, um, Using GPT-3, for example, you don't want um, swear words, for example, in the customer uh, response. One thing you should keep in mind is this mere reproduction of training data. Um, we, we did this already with um, when we talked about, uh, I think, the height of Mount Everest. So sometimes it was in feet, sometimes in meters, but it was always very precise and almost um, yeah, exactly reproduced. This sometimes this is something you intend. Um, if you do fact checking, we'll come to that later. But uh, sometimes this is also something that is dangerous and might lead to the reproduction of bias, for example, which is contained in internet language or internet uh, data in general. And um, think about the dangers here as well. And one thing I want to also mention in general advice is that with large language model classification tasks are also possible. So not only completion or generative tasks, but also computing which of the given options for completion is more probable. Um, so we will have an example later in the practical part in the next slot. 
But this is also something you could keep in mind if you have multiple choices you want to choose from, but they are all kind of completion related, then this is also possible. And sometimes this allows, or in each and every case, it allows you to ensure clean uh, output results. Um, yes, but sometimes um, you lose uh, performance in the end. But we, I think we'll see that uh, also in a minute. So let's start with the first strategy. Are there questions, by the way, in the meantime? Uh, I don't see any here. Okay, great. Um, the first strategy is defining context slash identity slash intent. So in general, defining context allows uh, the LLM to adjust to a specific task. We saw that large language models are trained on uh, or trained to generalize on a huge variety of tasks. And now we need to um, yeah, specify a task that should be, should be solved or the results might be very unexpected. I will show you some examples in a minute. Another aspect here um, outside of context is specifying the intent. So if you intend to produce something nice, something friendly, then this allows you to, if you, if you are able to include it in the prompt, it allows you to prevent insulting language. And in the end, this may significantly improve result quality. To demonstrate that, let me hop over to um, the Markdown document that you should already also be able to download. Uh, prompt engineering strategies. So um, we start with the, with this example over here, conversation with an AI assistant. So this is like the most um, transparent approach of starting a conversation with the AI. You cannot really communicate with the GPT-3 um, AI directly. It, I mean, it's just completion, the most probable completion, but you could create a virtual AI. Let's imagine that I'm talking to a virtual AI and then see what this AI would probably say. But again, no real fact checking there. So if you ask some questions like, um, uh, uh, um, the following is a conversation with an AI assistant and you ask, will AI destroy mankind? I will AI destroy mankind. I mean, valid question to ask. And then um, uh, I need to move my window here. Okay, what you can see here is that this response is actually not really based on the context that we gave here. So if we specify the prompt a bit more, yeah, and you can see that now um, the response is no longer centered about, uh, around the human but rather could come from the output from an AI. But this is just reproducing training data here. This or at least the ideas that came in training data already. So um, you could also ask questions like, do you hate me? I don't know. It's not a chatbot. It's not designed for that. But using this, you could emulate um, something um, very close to a conversation with a fictional AI, at least in the imagination of, of people who wrote the internet. But this is not the topic here. I just wanted to, to show you what this example is about here. Um, this is what we want to um, talk about here. The assistant is helpful, creative, clever, and very friendly. Those are context aspects that we include here to actually improve the results um, of, of our um, conversation. So if you would imagine that you would pipe this into a real customer form, for example, then you would certainly um, hope to receive better results 
if uh, you specify that the assistant was helpful, creative, clever, and very friendly. This is not um, given in each and every case. So you would have to explicitly state this. So feel free to try a bit around with this, uh, but I probably don't want to do this right now because uh, it might actually generate some quite harmful language if we change this to something else. But I think there's an example on uh, the official OpenAI example repository about uh, Sam, the sarcastic chatbot, uh, where they define a chatbot that is not helpful at all. And always tells things like, yeah, just Google it yourself. Why would I help you? Um, wow, what a stupid question and so on. Uh, you could also um, att attempt to do something and just by altering this context over here. Something else I wanted to talk about when we talk about um, significantly improving result quality is an example that is also prompt engineering related, but not GPT-3 related, but actually DAL-E2, I guess, related. So we have this tweet here. I hope it's still online. Yes, looks good. So the idea here was that you have given two cats, cat A and cat B, and one cat is real, it's a genuine photo, and the other one is generated by yeah, a model called DAL-E, which um, takes prompts, so human language, and generates images based on this. So the question is now to you, uh, the answer is given there, but uh, <laughs> okay, well, you probably guessed it. So I, I, I think I wouldn't have guessed it right. Uh, this one is actually the fake one. And you could probably spot it in some points here, people highlighted which points or areas in the image look kind of odd and off. But this is still a very, high definition and high quality image. And the, so we are not about how to generate such images. This is not the scope of the course, but the scope of this course is how to improve the prompts. And the idea to actually get such good results was to include um, a prompt prefix that says, I'm using uh, the following camera lens. And you now have to specify a very expensive camera lens model. And the more expensive it gets, the better results you would expect. I mean, if you think about completion, all those aspects, and um, the most probable output and reproducing bias, then this is not that odd or that far off because uh, you would actually expect this to happen um, based on the training data on the internet. I mean, the best photographers use the most expensive equipment. So um, maybe take this as an, yeah, okay, Lucas is not agreeing. Okay, uh, let's note that down. <laughs> but um, there's some kind of correlation there. And that one is, is being reproduced here. So maybe you can take this as an inspiration for your mini projects uh, to, um, yeah, maybe define something um, in this context which uh, is actually measurable. For example, yes, my IQ is, and then you take a number range and uh, then you add a prompt task and in the end you evaluate uh, what, uh, what, or what the, the um, correlation is between IQ and result quality. I don't know, M maybe you can some come up with something interesting here. And another thing I wanted to share on uh, that context here is uh, this meme I found on Twitter. Um, so those are all techniques that we will come across a bit later in this course or this lecture. But um, yeah, you can basically see that the one method outperforming them all was prompting the model with, I'm an expert Python programmer which actually increased the quality of the results. So what they tried to do here was um, to generate or work with a code model, which is used to generate, for example, Python code from uh, natural language instructions. So you could say, generate a function that does 
um, calculate all prime numbers until 1000 and then you would be given the code. And they did this with some quite difficult task and the results actually got better when prompted with such a statement, which again, it totally makes sense. So it's not randomly trying things, but if you think about, for example, Stack Overflow, then people who claim that they are good often perform better than uh, those that don't. But again, this might again reproduce some bias here. So think about um, those, I'm not a uh, but sentences or statements um, when, when you're in political debates, for example. Um, you should be careful at least. Um, but again, this could be something you could try out in your projects to reproduce some uh, bias and try to make it measurable. Okay, are there questions on this context thing? Okay, let's continue. The next strategy I want to introduce is few shot learning. And I already uh, teased you a bit about that. So the idea is a bit simple. Our LLM is trained already, it's pre-trained, but on a way too broad scope. So to narrow it down onto the task it should solve and onto the way this task should be solved, we provide it with some successful examples. And the idea is that on the internet or on the data that it was, was trained on, it's also quite common to have multiple instances or examples of the same kind um, follow each other. So it makes sense in completion. People would not, not have had to um, yeah, specifically alter their models to allow for future learning. It just comes given with the pre-training of large language models. Something you could also do with this is enforce or at least suggest a certain output format. I'll have an example right after this. So imagine um, that you want to extract numbers, for example, or I want to convert numbers, but want the result in meters and not in feet, then this can all be kind of enforced, well, at least suggested with um, few shot learning, where you would provide a few working examples. Something that one has to keep in mind here is that you can also very quickly run into overfitting. So if you cover a too narrow range of samples for your task in these few shots, then um, yeah, it's very likely that this will have no beneficial or at least a malicious or, or even a malicious effect on your results. Um, so if you repeat, for example, the same sample five times, then no matter what you write next, it will probably just repeat this sample for a sixth time. Samples must have a very high quality. So I'll be doing it interactively now in, in the console or in the um, chat box window and will include the model output into my next input. But this is something not typically done within few shot learning because again, the samples must have the most high quality you could think of. Because, and that's why what you will see me doing is um, I alter everything that the model gives to me and enforce my own quality and result standards. And this is the only way prompt or, or few shot learning will actually work and will be beneficial. Um, so remember computation cost increases linearly with the input length. So you basically want to have as few few shots as possible. You could also retrain the whole net, no problem, but it would not make sense um, when you have a very generalizing large language model. So the idea is to have as few sh shots as possible, as few samples as possible, but they must be of the highest quality and cover a very broad range of tasks. And we will see that in a minute. And I brought some examples. So something I'll be doing here, 
let me open the playground, is I will um, again, once again, use the stopping sequence because I don't want the model to indefinitely generate, uh, where is it? Here, indefinitely generate outputs uh, or output tokens, I want it to stop at a certain point. And first we have a so-called zero shot example. So this is what you all already did. We just take the task and require an output. And here you can see that I again specified this in the um, declarative form and not the imperative form. So I was trying to get a poem about springtime, because why not, that rhymes. So the last words should rhyme in some pattern and they don't, it doesn't work. Let's check whether it's actually a poem. Yes, probably. And it's also related to springtime, obviously, but it's not what we want here. So what would be the, the idea of um, few short learning now? Does anyone have an idea what we could do to actually make this a few shot eligible sample? Yes? So since the issue is more of rhyming than getting the spring time right, I would assume that you would provide a rhyming poem on this. And then... Thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, so the idea was to provide a rhyming poem to get the rhyming right. Um, one could actually alter this poem if one was a poet to actually rhyme. So uh, swinging, I don't know, I, I've no, I, I'm not a po poet. So uh, yes, I will copy some poems from the internet and I already prepared that here. So um, here's some other result. I mean, they are all random, but again, here, this also didn't work. So I will take uh, the poem Lines Written Early Spring by William Woodsworth. Anyone know? Does anyone know them? Lucas does. Okay, impressed, impressed. Um, so this is just uh, a, a small um, extent from that. And see what I'm doing here. I'm again using this um, stopping token as a separation character because in future shots, I want the model to finish the poem with such a character or such a token. And this will lead it to complete generation and I will just have a poem. Otherwise, in few short learning, the problem might be that um, actually the prompt, the core prompt might be generated again. So if you don't do that, then uh, the model might be tempted to just continue on generating more um, more parts. Let's, let's uh, demonstrate that here. So I just take the poem here. We generate something about winter time now because I mean, we don't want to repeat the task. We don't want to overfit uh, something about depression. I mean, it's winter and it's unsafe content apparently. But now the problem might be that actually instead of, for example, continuing the poem, Uh, begins with a stopping sequence. <laughs> it might just generate this prompt. Okay, maybe this, this task is not really suitable to demonstrate what I'm talking about, but um, the danger is that instead of writing, for example, a, an eight line poem, it might just write a four line poem and then generate the next prompt because no one told it to stop. So at this point, the model could then indicate, okay, I'm done with my poem. I'll write my um, stopping token here. It will stop generating and leave it to me to specify the next um, prompt. So let's do that again with stopping tokens. Okay, works. So as you can see, it's already rhyming, right? Um, but maybe the poems are not in such a form that, that we would enjoy. We want long, longer poems or more creative ones, I don't know. So I will use another poem here, Wintertime by Robert Louis Stevenson. 
again, just an exempt again. Oh, and I think I forgot the uh, stopping token at the end, which means it's not generated here. Um, maybe I'll add that, no problem. Okay, is it rhyming actually? It's not. Okay, um, let's regenerate maybe. So it might be that the topic is just too difficult or too uncommon to actually um, allow for easy rhyme generation. Ah, here we have something. Okay, it does work in the end, at least for this part. Um, but, but I mean, for such a difficult task like generating poem on a given topic, um, this works amazingly well. And you can see here again, we have a very dark um, poem sent a chill to my spine and, uh, but it rhymes. So, so we did everything um, and, and, and even in a quite complex scheme. So not just uh, pairwise, but rather uh, crossed alone and moan and around and sound. Not bad. So, but, but the, Interesting question now is whether this is actually better than just with the zero shot example. And we didn't do this as a zero shot example. We only did it with springtime, but in order to compare the performance, you would actually have to take this as a zero shot example. And we will do that here. Mm, again, it's not rhyming. So it's actually good what we did. But um, in order to quantify this further, you would have to conduct further experiments, larger data sets, better metrics, and so on. So another idea that you could take on using prompt engineering is, or using uh, future learning, is suggesting an output format. So the format that you would get here is quite arbitrary. Sometimes you get such a format, um, floating point and um, uh, unit abbreviation. Sometimes not. Sometimes you get a whole sentence out of it. And um, yeah, if you want to read out results automatically, this is not helpful. You want to enforce an output format. You could write, please give the answer unrounded in raw meters. I don't know. Maybe this will help. Hmm. Again, did not really help because now we have an equation here. So here it's definitely easier instead of doing the real prompt engineering to do few shot learning in this, um, this example. And here I even wanted to generate equations for each one of those. And it already works just with one short sample. Quite, quite impressive, as I think. Uh, and here we are at the next example. Okay, I will go over to the slide deck again. I have a quick comment. Yeah. Um, just... Uh... Just a, oops, uh, I'm not sure whether you can see me uh, quickly, choose the right cam. Ah, there. Just a very quick comment on the side. Um, you said that it works, but uh, this would contradict your statement just at the very beginning that prompt engineering too requires rigorous evaluation. I, don't, I just wanted to interrupt you there. So it does not work. It may work, maybe. It may work. We, can, we cannot, yes, yes, you're right. We cannot um, not yet say that it doesn't work. So it's at least in it this gave, regard. It gave us what we wanted once. <laughs> no problem. But uh, yeah, of course, always rigorously evaluate whether whatever you come up with actually works for the intended purpose at the scale. But believe me, people have done that on many, many examples and many, many tasks, and it, it's proven or 
at least empirically proven that future learning actually helps. So at least that should be the takeaway. But yes, you're right. It might depend on the task. I mean, people cannot have tried all the tasks that there are. And there might be some where it works not or not that well and where the generalization idea doesn't work. OK, yeah, thank, thank you for the comment. Further questions or remarks? OK. Instructions. So I already talked briefly about this. Um, originally, large language models did not perform well with instructions. And I already talked about this. This aligns with our expectations. So most probable completion does not work with instructions. But people found ways to actually retrain the large language models to be optimized to follow specified instructions, because this is what people want. People want to write imperatives and write to, want to define tasks, not decoratively, declaratively, um, but rather explicitly. Um, so uh, imagine, for example, the success of the programming language Haskell. Does anyone? Oh, people know, okay, but people probably don't use it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this this was so so maybe you can keep that in mind as as a comparison to to both ideas here. And humans like using explicit instructions. Um, but actually, instructions can be quite useful uh, to specify or clarify the task explicitly and more clearly. And I'll come to some examples here. So first, the, the uh, promised examples about the previous GPT-3 version that they had out there, which had been replaced actually uh, by this um, yeah, text Da Vinci 2. But uh, previous versions actually led to the following results. So I had to copy this from GPT's um, or OpenAI's website. This is an example they even advertise. The prompt was explain the moon landing to a six-year-old in a few sentences. I mean, we can try it out, why not? I think that's a valid explanation. Um, no problem, but those are the results that I um, warned you about that were previously um, given by GPT-3. Explain the theory of gravity to a six-year-old. Explain the theory of relativity to a six-year-old in a few sentences. Explain the Big Bang theory to a six-year-old. Explain evolution to a six-year-old. So um, yeah, just repeating this prompt and altering it in, in some way um, was a result that was going to happen. The same with questions, if you didn't this Q and A trick that we did. But then with the new model that I think, I'm pretty sure they incorporated into the tra training scheme for the new GPT-3 models, um, they report better results. So people went to the moon and they took pictures of what they saw and so on. Um, so keep that in mind, instructions didn't used to work. If you use older models or smaller models, they still might not work as well um, as you intend. So um, you can try it out later in the next session. We'll do uh, GPT-2 GPT actually. So feel free to try it out along, uh, but keep that in mind. And now about the other um, ideas with instructions. So instructions might actually be helpful. So if instructions are unclear, for example, the man walks across the street, future. I mean, what would you do if I prompted you with this? Yes? Thank, uh, so, so a future tense, basically. Yeah, thank you. That that was the idea. Let Let's see what GPT three does. Yes, the man will walk across the street. But that's not what I wanted here. I wanted it to generate um, the future result and the future prediction, like a time machine. 
Well, I didn't specify that. So that's my problem here in prompt engineering. Um, so with better instructions, even using an imperative here, describe what will happen in the future, we get pretty close to what I wanted. The man will continue walking across the street until he reaches the other side. So keep that in mind, clear instructions help. And for the future thing, um, maybe we can also maybe try a few times to generate output here. Uh, okay, pr pretty unlikely apparently, but um, if we really want to clarify what's happening here with this future tense, we can also declare this explicitly, put the statement in future tense. And uh, yeah, same, same results, but nevertheless, more clearly specified. Are there questions on those instructions? Maybe in the chat, no. Okay, I'll continue with intermediate steps. So this was also part of this um, meme that I showed to you. Here we have those intermediate steps. And this is actually quite a powerful tool as you'll see in a minute. Um, let's, let's start with an introduction that talks about brain teasers. So our task that we will try to solve in a minute is um, related to this question you will also often hear as interview questions, like um, how much does Manhattan weigh? Like the city bar of Manhattan and people are actually asked this in, I don't know, name any company here that does tech in the Silicon Valley, but um, then people are supposed to think about this question and to share their thinking and to elaborate how they could come up with a solution, do some quick math on this, but um, yeah, do a rough calculation computation and come up with a convincing result. And um, we'll also do that with the model in a minute. I mean, I mean, I could just ask, what does Manhattan weigh? So as you can see, uh, we have an overfitting case here. So uh, apparently this question was already contained in the training data set. Uh, but we even have a res result here. Um, maybe that's right, no one knows. But the idea is um, to also share the process of roughly estimating this. And we, we will do this using a technique called intermediate steps. So the idea is to split up the task into, splitting the task up, I, yeah, you can say that, uh, into multiple intermediate steps. Uh, so not doing everything one at a time, but rather doing multiple ones and um, yeah, getting, getting outputs there. Actually, uh, this multiple steps is also applied if you generate lists, for example. So we had this with a group example. Names of groups for a project. And if you force the model to actually just generate one uh, entry at a time, and you can do this by defining the stopping token or stop sequence, then you could get better results, but I'm not quite sure. Let's check. Uh, ah, oh no, that's not the right. You have to add new line as a stop sequence. Yeah, and then add it yourself again. But I mean, this, this is uh, uh, too easy of an example and too hard to evaluate, but maybe you will come up with a task that um, is more feasible for evaluation here. But uh, let's get back to this explanation. So splitting up generic tasks into multiple intermediate steps. 
And those may actually be represented by multiple execution steps, just as we did right now. And you will see what I mean in a minute. And this should also be reflected in the few shot learning samples. So if you combine few shot learning with intermediate steps, then of course, in those few shot learning samples, you also have to apply the same pattern of intermediate steps and follow the same um, rigid guideline to, to achieve consistent results. So we are not doing Manhattan now, we are doing weight of the citizens of Leipzig. Um, because that's something probably never has been asked in an interview. I don't know, maybe someone of you has been, but uh, let's ask. And I will remove the stop sequence again. Yeah. Maybe we'll get a result. This is impossible to answer without more information. Well, is it? We will get an answer in a minute. Okay, let's let's uh, do some prompt engineering here. The answer is really simple, and it is. Let's maybe phrase it that way. Ah, twelve thousand metric tons. So let's see whether that's is that actually the result here. Let's see. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, da, 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 da. No, it's not. It's wrong. And this is also something I got when I tried this out previously. The citizens of Leipzig were in total uh, one million kilograms, and this is this is not right. Uh, I mean, you could quickly calculate this in in your head, and uh, it doesn't make sense. But I mean, it looks like a right answer, right? So this is this is the thing that is being learned here by the model to to phrase it in the right way. But the answer itself doesn't make sense, really. So we will do it using intermediate steps. Our biggest problem here will be that the model will start um, generating new commands or new prompts. Uh, on its own when it thinks that it's done with the um, step declaration itself. So I will introduce a new strategy here, which is using double new lines as a stop sequence. Let's do that. It's a bit tricky to add here, actually. So you press enter, but if you pre press enter again, then it's just a single new line. But um, what you can do is you can select it, copy it, paste it two times, and then you have uh, double new line. Uh -huh. um, the, 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 the reason why we are doing this uh, double new line here is because we are using enumerations and enumerations typically with GPT-3 end on a double new line. So we force the model to end generation once the enumeration is done. I think I all also specified here. Yeah, you can read it afterwards, no problem. So let's think about how you would solve this question in an interview, right? You would first uh, think which constants you will need. I mean, this is also what the model pro uh, gave to us um, uh, with the response of, yeah, we need more information or the information is not sufficient. Yeah, just say what information you need and uh, see that we also prompt here with this enumeration start character. So this hyphen. Um, Let's generate. We need the population of Leipzig and the average weight of a person. And this is actually quite close to what I did previously. Um, so right now we are not doing few shot learning. Uh, it's all zero shot. I will not alter this. I will just append my, um, yeah, my prompt components that I thought of previously. The formula to compute the city's weight is. Population of Leipzig times average weight of a person. It's again, yeah, related to uh, what I received previously. But nevertheless, our prompt still works. 
So uh, I'm not adapting my prompt to the results. This would not be zero shot, but I'm just um, yeah, appending what I'm thinking. So if it would be a few shot scenario, actually would, you would have to make sure that this is all very uh, real and very good and well formatted because garbage in, garbage out. But here I can just append for the city of life the constants values are, and that's a knowledge question, right? Population of Leipzig, which is actually quite close. Um, let's see. Yeah. Quite close, actually. Uh, here I got 600,000. But I mean, both are reasonable answers. And the average rate apparently now incre increased since I, I prepared this example to 75 kilograms. I mean, we could also regenerate and see what we have there. Yeah, so um, it's not consistent, but that's not the goal here. Uh, the next prompt will be, if we put that into the formula, the weight of the citizens of Leipzig in total is. And now we do some quick math. And actually that the result of this computation here. So this, of course, this differs from what I received previously, but it's still very close. Uh, actually, the math is good enough. <laughs> um, why is it? Uh, okay, so the numbers are right and the number is close enough. But it's it's not built for math. I, I already uh, showed this to you, and I mean, you can apply this pattern to other questions as well, uh, where you would require intermediate steps. But this is better than just 1 million kilograms, right? Or, or what was what was our previous answer? Some, some garbage. So as you can see here, intermediate steps can actually help us. And up until now, we specified our intermediate steps ourselves by giving a very close and very um, restrictive um, mesh of prompt questions. But we can also have the LLM generate the steps. What would be the steps to determine the total weight of the population of the city of Leipzig? Okay, let's, let's hope that this works now because I didn't test it that in depth. Okay, convincing enough. The first step would be to determine the population of the city of Leipzig. The next step would be to determine the average weight of the population. The final step would be to multiply the average weight by the population. This is quite close actually to what I got here. And now our next step, if you want, is just asking for the result. Maybe it works. Uh, I, I have to append a new line here because um, uh, the double new line is the stop stopping sequence. And again, makes sense. And we can accept this as a correct answer. So quite impressive if you think about this. You could solve any question that would require in-depth knowledge and human intelligence um, if you just formulate the prompt in a right way. Are there questions on intermediate steps? No. Okay, I'll continue. And I think this is, yeah, this is the last um, strategy I would like to introduce. It's allowing and expecting edge cases. So in, in some problems, you already noticed that things are not working as they are intended. And the idea here is to allow for special values as a result. And one special value might be exception statements, but don't think of exceptions as software exceptions like API not responding or something, but rather as um, the results of ill-posed questions, questions that don't really have a have an answer that makes sense or um, questions that are unknown, not understood, 
And you should uh, be aware of that uh, happening. So there are two ideas here. You could specify uh, how to handle those exceptions in the context, in the instructions. Um, please handle the following exception the following way. We'll have an example in a minute. But you could also include it in few shot learning. Uh, so add some samples that handle this exception. And then the LLM will, using this few shot learning, learn how to handle this exception from the few shot learning. I will have an example also afterwards. Something you should also consider is that for classification-like tasks, so uh, what is the sentiment of the following text, for example, you should also cover a broad scope of classes and not just positive, negative, but also things like neutral, aggressive, and so on. This might all occur. And if you evaluate your model, and uh, for example, if you want to uh, write a bot that bans users on an online forums based on their uh, sentiments uh, in the text they write, I don't know, any use case, then um, this might lead to real program exceptions if you expect just positive and negative as uh, output values. So keep that in mind. And you can also attempt to handle this using prompt engineering because just um, handling the exception and passing it on to a human, for example, is not really satisfying. You want to handle them um, using prompt engineering. I, have, I will have an example. Yeah, in the same category also fault this expect output that don't match your desired pattern. We already saw this when I asked for unit conversion. And sometimes we got an equation, sometimes we just got a number, sometimes we got a sentence. So expect this also to happen. But again, you can conquer this with few shot learning. Let's talk about the, the examples here. So allowing and expecting edge cases. I'm building up a Q&A scenario here. Again, unit conversion and just doing some samples. Um, I want to have um, results as full sentences, and this should work because I'm doing future learning here. But now I ask a question that just doesn't make sense. So does anyone know what quips and quabbles are? So I don't either. Uh, just random words, random gibberish. And we can just ask, OK, there is nothing such as quabble. Um, this is not what I was hoping to be happening. Ah, so here, there are four quips in a quabble. Apparently also the same result that we got here. Here we get this response again. Ah, no, it's 10. So if it's not really defined, and makes no sense, it can't be consistent either. So um, we need to find a way to get around this. And the easiest way probably is introducing few shot samples that just yield an unknown special value. So what I will do here is I will add another example that makes no sense, just somewhere in between. How many quirks in a group and yeah, just answer it with unknown. And now if we prompt the original question, how many equips in a quabble, we also get unknown. We don't get a generic response like there is no such thing or I don't know what to do. We get explicitly the exception statement that we wanted to get. And um, if you do question answering or anything that involves such things, then this is a very useful strategy. But as I already mentioned in the slide deck, you can also do this using the context. So you can explicitly write it down. These are some questions with answers. If the question makes no sense, the answer will be, what a weird question, lol. So again, as I promised, you can uh, choose the ex exception statement yourself. And it works. By the way, normal question answering still works. So how many uh, pound in a metric ton? Uh, let's see. Is that right? Yeah, 
Okay, so um, it doesn't harm the evaluation, at least we have no uh, indication so, but um, we get this explicit um, statement also without few short learning. Another example here, requiring a high level of certainty. So let's just check what the model knows about me. I'm a German software engineer, apparently. Okay, let's regenerate a few times. I'm a CEO and co-founder of InnoGames, a leading German developer and publisher of online games. So apparently the thing with the German works because I mean, it's not, so it's a quite German name, you know, but um, in the end, this makes no sense. So I Googled all those companies that I found here and they don't have anyone named like me as CEO. Um, Deckers and company. Hmm. Um, also here I was uh, supposed to be CEO of Flix Mobility. Uh, no, uh, I, I checked who that was and it wasn't someone like me. Um, but again, requiring a high level of certainty, let's just say if the answer is not known, the answer is unknown. And it works. But um, yeah, nevertheless, I mean, it still works if we just ask who, for example, um, Angela Merkel is, Chancellor of Germany. <laughs> um, I'll come to that problem in a minute. So we must be careful when evaluating the performance of knowledge-based tasks without true external ground truth. So if we um, design a task to check the knowledge of GPT-3, we cannot rely on this mechanism that I just introduced to you. We cannot just ask, um, do you know this person? If not, say unknown, then one 1,000 people and count the number of unknowns. This doesn't make sense. We still have to check whether the results are actually true in that sense. So directly prompting for truth doesn't work. Um, so if, if we ask the model to please output the truth and please be sure about what it's outputting and just only write really existing things, this doesn't work. So let's see whether, ah, okay, that is actually a, a song by the midnight, but that probably isn't, at least I didn't know. Um, here I got the hills have eyes and I Googled for quite a time to find any band that has a song called the hills have eyes. There's a movie and a book, yes, but um, I mean, the, the level of confidence that is, um, supposed to be uh, after that prompt is just um, not matched. And we can actually ask the reverse question, is there a song called The Hills Have Eyes by the band The Midnight? And get the response of no. Let's check this vampires thing, by the way. The answer should be yes then, let's see. Yes, okay. Um, so weird things are happening if you really try hard to get truth out of the model and directly prompting for truth doesn't work and direct evaluation like how many of those people do you know in that direction or do you know this person yes or no both don't work so you will have to come up with some other ways but in the end this is just the same thing you are doing or you have been doing all the time with uh, traditional machine learning and deep learning. You have always been compiling data sets, labeling them, annotating them, verifying the results, maybe doing crowd uh, sourcing on, on the evaluation or the labeling, then running the model, um, evaluating a matrix, and you will do the same, the very same pipeline here, as I, as I said last week. But in the next session, um, in about half an hour, we will also talk about um, this approach a bit about this uh, pipeline and how to integrate um, our GPT-3 model into here. I want to introduce another example before. Um, 
about this yeah knowledge based questions um, issue. So we are still talking about edge cases here, but um, yeah, something you already should have noticed when we talked about Angela Merkel. So Olaf Scholz certainly is not unknown, but here is uh, he is the Minister of Finance of Germany. So apparently the model is outdated. So, uh, which, which makes sense if you train on the internet, even right now, there are many web pages that are outdated. And uh, if you train on them, you would get outdated results. But nevertheless, there has been a cutoff, a cutoff in the training data. And they even on, on the website of OpenAI explicitly stated it, at least before they introduced um, these second generation models here. Um, before that, they explicitly said that they did a cutoff in, I think, December 2019, which means that if you ask questions like, um, wait a second, du, 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 du. Uh, what is COVID-19, for example? Wait. Okay, that's creepy. Uh, it sh uh, uh, <laughs> shouldn't. Ah, let's let's ask a different question. When it's December twenty nineteen, it makes sense that the models still have some knowledge about this. What is the COVID nineteen pandemic? Why doesn't it work? I still have stop sequence defined. Du, 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 du. Okay, here we're talking about a potential for a larger outbreak. <laughs> well, if they knew. Um, so there's, there's certainly a cutoff. If you ask this question to the new model, new model generation, then we already are talking about a global outbreak and so on. Um, yeah, what could you do to find out this cutoff time stamp, basically? I mean, you could ask. <laughs> um, you will all now scream at me doing this. What was the time that your um, training data ended or, or um, was finished crawling. <laughs> I mean, uh, this doesn't make sense. So uh, garbage in, garbage out again. But I mean, you could ask uh, questions about timestamps that uh, the model could have knowledge about, and then you need to be very careful uh, about the results because if you, for example, ask Da Vinci one about what is the corona pandemic, uh, da, 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 da. Uh. Mm. okay, when I, when I did this last time, maybe maybe they also altered this version, but uh, when I did it last time, uh, this was again garbage in, garbage out. And um, I mean, Corona is kind of a term that has been used before. So um, there were also some predictions about the pandemic in 2030 with very accurate timestamps, at least seemingly accurate. But what, what you could ask, for example, an ex uh, interesting question would be, what is GPT-3? So kind of self-awareness. And it's a next generation blockchain platform. Wow, okay, let's ask a DaVinci 2. Now it's a machine learning platform. Okay, let's ask again. Okay, so maybe uh, the data cut cutoff for this uh, generation two model 
is also before the publication or the widespread of GPT GPT three. Um, but I mean, maybe some of you are interested in this and will do some content engineering project there. But um, it's maybe one could find a prompt that helps us identify this further. But maybe it's also written somewhere. I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware that fact checking is not a good idea. And um, at least if you do it in this uh, big bench, there are some tasks that actually do this, then there should be some rigor evaluation, just as we have there. Okay, are there any questions on the last part that we had here? Maybe in the chat. So let me quickly sum up what we did. We talked about some strategies that you could use to enhance your um, prompt engineering and to actually um, know or get to know what you are doing uh, to just get over this level of simply testing uh, with garbage in, garbage out. And some general advice here, just think about this probably major takeaway of today you're not commanding the machine you're trying to achieve or trying to get the most probable completion. I think we will also maybe get, a, get to this once we see um, what the transformer models actually look like. And then it's just a small step of defining a language model ahead. And then you will see why this makes sense. We talked about the importance of context and intent. Few short learning should now be clear to every one of you. Uh, we had this instructions example and this intermediate step example, which was quite powerful actually for solving generic tasks. And we were talking about edge, edge cases um, that you should consider if you build real applications out of this and don't sit there supervising the prompt form all the time. Okay, that concludes part one. See you in half an hour, I think. <laughs>